Hey there, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 397. And today, I have past guest Mr. Michael Rowe back to talk about violence. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And I love everything that we do here at Whistlekick. I love the martial arts. And that's what Whistlekick was founded in. A love for the traditional martial arts. And that's why we have two shows for you. Every Monday and Thursday, we bring you a different show, all for free. You can check out the show notes and a whole bunch more at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you head to whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15, you can get 15% off anything and everything that we sell over there. It's not only a store, we have links to all of our other projects, like Marshall Journal and a few other things that are brewing. There's just stuff going on there all the time. So if you haven't checked it out lately, please visit whistlekick.com. We've done a number of shows recently on violence, on the reality of violence. And from day one of this show, that subject has been something that has been very popular among our listeners. We get a lot of feedback when we do shows on the subject. We get a lot of commentary if we have a guest on who maybe says something that is a bit unconventional or untraditional. And here, we may have a bit of that. So we've brought back past guest, Mr. Michael Rowe, who first appeared on episode 82. And we were reconnected because he introduced me to Master Ratinder Ahuja from episode 378. Well, as martial artists do, we started talking and realized that he had a lot to say about violence based on his experience, his background, which I'm not going to spoil, but it's a little bit different than what most of us are going to experience day to day. And it's even different from what many of the so-called violence and self-defense experts out there are going to experience from day to day. So we brought him back and here we have that conversation. Mr. Rowe, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's great to be back there, Jeremy. I think you hold the distinction of being, of having the longest gap between appearances. So we're looking at It'll be 300 plus episodes in between when you first came on, which was episode, checking my notes, 82. And here we are. I don't know what episode number this is going to be, but we are past episode 382 at the time of this recording. So it's uh, been that long, huh? It's been a while. It's been, I mean, it's been over three years. Well, my wife would tell you that's a long time for me to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Well, I'm not promising that you've kept your mouth shut. It just hasn't been open on this show. <laughs> oh, that's true. But she, she, if she would say I have any opportunity for me to get out and talk to somebody about something that I'm interested in. Uh, I always find a way to do it. Well, good. I, th- I think that that's, I mean, that's the way that we share knowledge. I mean, that's the whole foundation of this show is to tell stories, to talk about our experiences as martial artists and hopefully to feel a connection with each other and, you know, ideally learn something or if not learn something make you question something, make you think. Exactly. Help can make connections out there in the universe. Yeah. Now we started talking again after your introduction, but for, for me to master Ratinder Ahuja, someone you, you'd had the opportunity to train with and that you, you've maintained contact with. That was a great episode. And for listeners, that was episode, where are my notes again? Uh, 378. So you can check that out and we'll, we'll link that in the show notes, but that's not what we have you on here to talk about today. When you came on last time, we talked about you. We talked about your time, your story in the martial arts. But what we're going to talk about today is, a, is pretty specific. It's something that, I don't know if you want to use the term expertise, but something that, if not, you have a fair amount of experience with, and that is the reality of violence. Is, is expertise or, or experience, which, which word would you prefer there? Oh, yeah. Uh, specialized experience, I guess you could okay. better than say. I've, I've never really been, felt great with that t- title, uh, subject matter expert or expert or, you know, expertise is okay, I guess. But uh, uh, I'm kind of specialized in the subject. I have a, a little bit better than uh, average knowledge on, on the subject. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know as we go along, we're going to talk about, you know, where that specialized knowledge comes from. But let's let's start this off. Let's let's pick a direction and, and head there. And when we talk about violence, we've had people on the show, Rory Miller, Tony Blauer, folks who are have made a, a name for talking about violence. But when we have those folks on, we don't go too deep into the difference between 
what we generally perceive as violence versus what those folks, what you yourself are talking about as the reality of violence. So what are some of those differences? What's Where's the gap between reality and perception? Well, perception is greatly, I'd say, affected by what media does for us. You know, the movies, television, uh, some respects, uh, you know, the seminars that are various uh, uh, compatriots are out there teaching in terms of violence that uh, martial arts has been dealing with the the concept of violence and violence on you know the battlefield events eventually violence in in their communities and sometimes violence at home it's 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 always worked on that equation and what what is different is uh, well there's a whole lot of things that sometimes it it delves into fear it delves into things that we're just not willing to talk about in 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 polite company and people just want to shy away from it. There's a lot of stuff, uh, the gut, so to speak, within violence. But also the biggest problem is because most of us, I, I, I know a couple of friends of mine, like Rory Miller, uh, I met once or twice, and, and Tony Blair I've met once. Uh, they'll talk about it. it they're, we're practicing in most martial systems, uh, I guess basically it would be theoretical violence. Because most of us don't really have a, a a real grasp on what violence truly is, um, society wide. I mean, we all have little bits of experiences uh, with maybe a small sliver of what violence really could be. I mean, when we talk about violence, we talk about like it's something simple, like a cat or a dog, and violence is more like one of those fantastic beat beasts that you would find in Hogwarts, uh, something totally amazing, something different, something that changes from moment to moment, maybe becomes invisible, sometimes changes shape. It, it's something that's totally different. It's not something that we are ever going to wrap our heads around the first time, the second time, maybe even the the tenth time that we experience it. Is that what you're no, saying? Um, yeah, for for many for many of us, well, some of us have some experience of bullying. Uh, I was I grew up in nineteen in the nineteen seventies in a small rural community, and uh, in terms of bullying, you know, I was the first child in that community that was a uh, at that time it was called hyperkinetic disorder, uh, now known as ADHD. You know, so I was taking medications at school. Uh, and once other kids started finding that out, they were merciless. They had all kinds of names, pill popper, hothead, uh, you know, druggy, all kinds of name calling going along there. Uh, and then there's also the, uh, and that's bad enough when you're getting it from your peers, but then you were getting it from uh, adults too, who felt, well, this is a made up disorder. All you need is a nice, you know, Swiss spank to the, to the bottom and we'll get you to focus. Right. Uh, Teachers who didn't understand, teachers who were refusing to uh, cooperate. So I, I dealt with bullying violence, but from both uh, mental and sometimes physical as a child. A lot of people experience that to some extent. But then there's a whole slew of other stuff that comes in bullying that's changed over time. I mean, I didn't have to deal with cyberbullying. That's changed. That's something that's relatively new. Uh, I've had to help try to get my children to deal with that. And it's a whole new animal that's, it's morphed. It's still the same animal. It's still bullying a uh, form of violence, but it's, it's changed uh, its uh, attacks. It's no longer using claws. Now it's using teeth in a different way, so to speak. Maybe, maybe we should define violence because if we're going to have a conversation about this, I think, you know, I, I, this is kind of the nerdy, the nerdy way. I know it's cliche, you know, when you start having a, a conversation you have to define the subject and and i yeah. had teachers in college who got really mad that i use dictionary definitions to work yeah on. what is is yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh we're not going back there we're not going back to no, him no, yeah, 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 yeah. is for me um, <laughs> <laughs> if you get that joke or you don't it says something about how old you were in 19 yeah. <laughs> four? i want to say 94 um yeah. so when when you, if i said what is your definition of violence? You know, what does violence include? What does violence not include? What would that be? Oof. 
Well, for me, and violence includes anything that is causing harm psychologically, mentally, physically, and spiritually to another by intention. Mm. For me, that's what it comes down. There's always going to be some form of, uh, uh, and, and that incl- excludes some forms of violence, in my opinion, because there are people who are unintentionally obtuse and don't recognize that they're being rude or uh, abusive verbally or even accidentally when they're bumping into people that they, just, they, they don't know they're doing it, and yet they might be hurting somebody. That's a form of violence still, but I don't really consider it so much when I'm talking about violence. Do we need to throw something in about against the victim's will? Against the victim, yeah, definitely against the victim's will, um, at the target's will, whatever you want to call the victim, the target, the receivee, uh, where where they've at least expressed, "Hey, you need to stop that," or "Excuse me," and that, and yet it continues. Okay. So, uh, but you know, for me, violence takes many. I, I've experienced a lot. I mean, I experienced a lot of different types of violence. Um, like I said, from bullying when I was a child to uh, uh, I've worked in law enforcement. I've dealt with uh, uh, investigations on the street, uh, arresting individuals. I've worked in corrections. I've been deployed to a war zone. So for me, violence takes uh, is a different animal in many, many respects. Uh, but I think, you know, the... I guess uh, there are two psychological type of definitions. I, I guess a friend of mine, uh, Rory Miller, brings up was a- social violence and asocial violence. And those are two main broad categories. And you know, it, the, the defining moment of violence, it's a lot like when I was uh, in the military and we had to define terrorism. Terrorism has over 180 definitions in the United States alone, depending on which agency you're talking about. So... <laughs> I don't know if that would help any. <laughs> okay. well, if, if we're not going to, if, if we can't get too deep into a, a formal definition, let's start talking about if I was to ask you for the situation, the, the, let's say not common occurrence, but the scenario that is most different between the reality and the perception from someone who has not experienced it. What is that situation? Is that, you know, a mugging, is that a sexual assault? Is it a drive-by shooting? You know, what, what, which, of, which scenario leads to the biggest gap in understanding? Well, I think all of them, until you've experienced them, uh, have a major gap. Um, Speaking-wise, uh, let's, let's just say, I mean, uh, a lot of parents might get this analogy. Uh, they, they maybe played some baseball or they played some football at one point and their kid wants to play and they need a coach, but they've never coached anyone. <laughs> right. So they coach a, a, their little league, whatever sport. Uh, and they win three or four games and they're feeling pretty good about themselves, but they wouldn't want to expect to get a call from, you know, in my exec, the Nebraska Cornhuskers are not about to ask and help me come out and coach one of their, their football team. Based because my kid won three uh, out of four games in their little league, midget league, whatever they're called these days, uh, program, just because I won three. And yet, for the most part, many martial arts instructors I've encountered, it's they either have no real experience dealing with violence, they've never been mugged, uh, they, they, they were usually maybe bullied a little bit uh, verbally and maybe had a few fights as a, as a kid um, or maybe a young teenager, but they've never been held hostage. They've never been shot at. And no one had even threatened to stab them. It's all theoretical. It's something that they, they, they never had really felt that, holy moly, I might be seriously hurt if what I do next does not protect me. And everything is it's theoretical, and and yet we you know we don't have people that in most most cases a lot of martial arts instructors they're all great instructors. Don't get me wrong, the, the instructors I'm talking about it's not that they don't have great skills. They have wonderful skills. They have wonderful years of tradition behind them, and those movements at, that they're being practiced at one point were used to keep somebody alive. 
<laughs> and but for the most part, you know, and when you got a peak time of peace, like uh, until recently, I mean, until 2001, the United States had a very long run of not really being actively involved in uh, a lot of problems worldwide. I mean, there was a little flare ups here and there, and some of our military people had to deal with some forms of you know, violence on the seas and on land. But now they have a, a greater experience and understanding. And I think that's the same with a lot of people. Uh, law enforcement has, a, has one type of experience, but their job was to, to run towards the problem. You know, uh, self-defense, we're teaching you to you know, survive, get away from the problem, move on and get out. So, but there's a lot of people teaching that that really have no understanding. Uh, of what it is. I know many men that have uh, taught women self-defense that viscerally have no idea what a woman's feeling when, the, when they're, uh, a, a rape is occurring. I, I have to admit, I have always found that a bit weird. Uh, but, but there weren't a lot of women out there teaching the self-defense either at the time when that was happening. Sure. So the, the men were doing the best they could with what limited understanding they have. Um, to me, it's like the, the, the high school jock teaching about anti-bullying, because they, but they were, they were the ones that were bullying <laughs> when they were in high school. It's like, yeah, now that they have kids, they understand that that, that kind of behavior isn't acceptable. Uh, but when they, were, when they were children, the only real reason they understand bullying is because, well, they were the bully. What would have stopped me when I did this then is what they're theoretically teaching you. And it's a lot of theory. And until it you know, becomes practical, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of unemotional. And that's, that's the biggest, I think, gap is, is, is the emotional gap that changes from the theoretical practice in the lab, our dojos, dojangs, whatever you want to, coons if they're Chinese. Um, we're practicing, we're working with theoretical violence. And then you get on the street and someone drives by and starts shooting. Uh, not, maybe not at you, but you know, at this guy just you know, 12 feet away that you know, was in their territory that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, or you, you happen to be involved in a, in a neighborhood you didn't know in and you get uh, someone defending their territory, so to speak, you know, with a, a lot of posturing, a little, uh, what Rory Miller calls a monkey dance. You know? and, but you don't know you're in it <laughs> until it starts happening. So and, until that happens, the emotional aspect isn't there. We watch it. We see it on the news. Sometimes we hear something really bad happening, and we feel it's like we, we feel a lot of, of, of sympathy and maybe a little bit of empathy of what's going on. But unless you've been in it until, until it happens, you really don't know about that visceral feeling, that, that, that blood draining from your every, everything right to, to what, what needs to be done. And you, you got that whole adrenaline, endorphin, cocktail mix running through your body. So I think, yeah, that would be the biggest area that is left out in our training environments for most of us is, is dealing with that emotional component. And the reason a lot of that gets missed is the instructor hasn't experienced it. Sure. And for some people, the why that's important might be obvious, but let's let's make sure that we address that before we move on in case it's not for someone. You know, what happens under that emotional influence, that emotional uh, component that changes the reality of the situation? Well, reality... The <sighs> We all have uh, that. We've all heard the fight or flight response. And that's, uh, you know, uh, Darwin evolution, whatever theory you want to go with. Uh, that's our body's natural reaction. Hey, we are either going to have to run for our lives or fight for our lives. Uh, and for some people, uh, that triggers, and there's a th actually a third one that comes in. It's also freeze because some people will just get that total deer in the headlight look because they can't believe this is happening to them. They've heard about it on the news, but they, oh, I can't believe this is happening now to me. That whole chemical of endorphins and adrenaline that's being pumped in the body does a lot of things that if you've never experienced it, you're not going to be ready for uh, things like tunnel vision. You're not going to have a big, wide angle. You know, when you're in the dojang, practicing your self-defense techniques, you've you got an idea of what's coming. You, you know you got nice, soft mats to fall onto. you got an instructor keeping you safe. Uh, he's not going to let anything really bad happen to you. Uh, so you don't really get that tunnel vision. 
And you can see, you know, even when you do like multiple type uh, opponents, even in a classroom setting, you know, you're somewhat safe. You know, the instructor's not going to let bad things happen. Um, tunnel vision, when, when it really starts happening, you, you, you're, 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 you, you've got only what's right in front of you. It's just that alone is, is very disconcerting because you, you have to constantly be looking around to see if he's got friends that are suddenly coming to his aid because he's losing. Uh, because he's, he, you successfully defended yourself. You got him on the ground. You're about to escape and you turn right into, oh, his buddy. But you didn't see him. You also didn't hear him because your, your hearing kind of goes. It's a, another feeling that goes bye-bye. Um, a lot of our um, small, untrained, Fine motor skills, uh, which we don't use under stress, uh, deteriorate. So finding a pressure point gets a lot more difficult when when, when everything is hit the uh, ventilation system, so to speak. And if it keeps going, eventually all you have are those big, gross body motor actions, like throwing a kick or throwing a punch or a palm hill. You know, complex skills get harder and harder to combine. And complex skills are those where we have to with, with some form of timing, put them together. So that emotional thing that goes in place in, in training, it's just very rarely ever there. Um, I teach knife disarms and knife self-defense techniques in my classes. And when they're all first taught, we, tar we teach with a little bit of a, a nice, safe training object, a rubber knife. If you get poked with it, it bends, nothing ha bad happens. Uh, but after you got the general movement, then we move to an aluminum trainer. So it looks a little bit more like a real knife, but if you get poked with it, you feel it hurts a little bit. So you don't like that. And at some point, uh, I actually utilize what is called a shock knife. It's kind of like being hit with a, a stun gun, not a taser, mind you, but you know, a little electrical shock if you touch the edge of the blade. And when you're really worrying about, oh, that's going to hurt. Well, a cut's going to hurt too. It's going to cause, you know, severe bodily injury or possibly death it the 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 actual performance of the same technique which when they were using the rubber knife looks so beautiful <laughs> suddenly it's very ugly it might work but it's very ugly now it's not as pretty because they're worrying they're their, their vision narrows they, they actually some of that adrenaline kicks in uh so that's one component where we, where we work in my classes, at least we, we work with that. We, the, the emotional adrenaline dump is, is something that always goes in there. Um, and there's a lot of aspects to it that just get crazy. I mean, our, our whole emotional system about, uh, you know, what's going to happen uh, if I succeed here. And then somewhere in the back of your head might be that little voice going like, okay, now uh, uh, can I just rip his arm off? Uh, <laughs> you know, Superman-ish, but, oh, I take the knife and uh, I stab him with it. Oh, well, now you've gone too far. Now you've got to worry about courts. Uh, and that's another whole emotional thing is, is, that, is, is people start really worrying about. And, and it's funny well, in the middle of fighting for your life, a thought may go, I'm like, okay, if I take this too far, I could go to jail. And that starts interfering with the whole thought process right. and response process. All those emotions start swirling around like a, 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 a hurricane. And so on one side of the, the spectrum there, you have the fear of going too far. But then on the other side, I think a lot of us as martial artists are dismissive of the idea that given a situation we will have no problem pulling the figurative trigger that we will have no problem harming someone if need be when in my very limited experience i see the exact opposite that a lot of people are so apprehensive to cause harm to another that situations that could have been dealt with early on have you know ultimately escalate beyond where they should have exactly uh you know, a lot of people have a little, little false sense of security because of their training environment. Um, in, in reality, and I, I cannot remember where I've heard this, but I, I really believe it entirely. When we're talking about dealing with violence and, and, and fighting back and uh, protecting ourselves into the utmost extreme, we're talking about making uh, cripples and corpses and widows and orphans. 
And if you're not doing that in every class, obviously most of us aren't. Uh, Max, probably all of us aren't. <laughs> if you're not doing that in every class, uh, creating cripples or, or you know corpses, you're obviously putting in safety measures, controls. So we have a safe training environment. As I always tell all my students, we got to stop in certain points. We have to have some form of control. Otherwise, we eventually have no one to practice on. Uh, <laughs> you know that, that you know that old apocryphal stories of how samurai swords were tested on prisoners, uh, whether it was truth, whether they were alive or dead when it happened. Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't there then. I, I, I've heard the story, and I'm sure many of your uh, listeners have heard them. You know, if they've worked with samurai swords, you know, at one point there would mark how many corpses did this bot, this sword go through before it stopped. Um, but that's, you know, you know, what, what does this do? I mean, what are we capable of doing? Um, there are a lot of people out there when training is the, is the biggest thing that comes down to, and the more realistic our training, the less we're going to have to adapt the training when it comes to reality. But, and, but we can't be a totally realistic. I mean, even, you know, I, I hear people talking with these UFC backgrounds about how it's the greatest uh, sport that you know, simulates real self-defense and real violence. And yet, you know, uh, there's still a lot of safety rules in there. They still have a referee. It's, there's no, uh, it's, it's not Sparta. It's not the Roman Coliseum yet. Uh, <laughs> where anything goes. Uh, there are more rules than there used to be. There are a lot more rules than there used to be. And, and there are a lot of, you know, a lot of things are, and people have this false impression that uh, I think maybe a UFC person would have a much better job uh, dealing with, uh, I don't say just a much more good time dealing with the, uh, the emotional and adrenaline cocktail that they're going because they, they feel yeah, th those punches aren't being pulled. And if they get into an arm lock, it could break. If they don't give up, if they don't tap out, there's always a possibility of some serious bodily injury happening in that octagon. So they're, they're used to dealing with that emotional cocktail a little bit better, but they get into a real situation and a knife or a gun is pulled they're going to feel that cocktail again a lot more straightforward because, you know, depending on how much training they've actually done with it. I mean, how many people uh, train with a loaded weapon on their dojang floor? None that I know of. Hopefully and, not. and rightfully so. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would never encourage that. I mean, it's like, okay, here's a weapon point at you. Is that a loaded gun? I don't know. Well, we find out. Disarm me. Uh, that's not the way we do it. Uh, you know, we, we love to have uh, training situations to be as realistic as possible. But then when certain training situations get too realistic, uh, like the, I know I read in the news not too long ago about um, uh, 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 a active shooter uh, training situation that happened on a campus and like no one except a very handful of people knew it was a, a drill. <laughs> and there was some a real big blowback on that because uh, it was too real. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it, we we deal with that whole emotional aspect in every aspect of our training, and and it's really really hard. And as you would say, it's very hard to get past the surface to to the exact feelings because they are very visceral when somebody is going to seriously harm you and you don't know whether they're going you know if you get knocked unconscious you have no idea what they're going to do to you you don't know if they're just going to take your wallet and go shoot you in the head stab you leave you alone you, you have no idea and so when that really hits the fan so to speak of your brain process it, it starts to shut down because it hasn't been prepared for it it's not ready for it how do we work on preparing for that? How do we bring some of that emotional stuff into our training? How, how can, obviously it's never going to be completely real. No. But how do we get it closer? Well, the, the one that requires open-mindedness on the instructor's part. First, they have to realize, hey, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about here. Practically, this is theoretical for me. <laughs> you know, uh, we, uh, you know, you can talk about time travel in the movies and, 
and it's all nice theory, but what's a, what, what would really happen? What would a real flashpoint experience happen that we don't have a clue? No one's done it yet. Well, that we know of. Uh, we don't know. So getting it close to the can to reality without hurting somebody, it, I think the biggest thing is coming up with different ways. Um, different methodologies and rotating through them so that uh, you never get really used to one limitation. Um, you know, moving really, really, really slow. I like that one the best. Uh, we, we we utilize, it's, yeah, everything is slow motion, going nice and soft, but kind of Tai Chi-ish in some respects. But when I'm sparring with somebody at that speed, even the eyes can become a target because I can touch the eye. There's, but I'm going slow enough uh, that the person can move back with it. They realize my eye was entirely open. Hardest part, of course, is getting everyone to move at a slow speed. <laughs> it's so easy to defend against the punches coming at you slow when you suddenly go to normal speed. Uh, so it's, it's really tough. But then at the same time, then to change that up, uh, then of course I also go at a more uh, of, a, of a boxing match where people are actually hitting really, uh, what you're hitting at full speed and, and full almost full power. But of course with protective gear on to some extent, because uh, people do have to work the next day. They don't want broken noses and you know broken ribs. So we, we, we work that whole range. Uh, some people that deal with violence will work with things uh, with less and less restrictions on them. Uh, law enforcement and military personnel, they, they can use simunition rounds. Simunition is great. It's, 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 it's being fired at by you know, a weapon that you're already used to, you, and, and you will feel it. It'll leave, it'll leave a paint mark. won't kill you. <laughs> but you realize you've been hit. Um, and then, of course, there's you know, learning to never, uh, you know, just because you got hit with something good, uh, you can acknowledge it, but you don't give up after that point because uh, our bodies, we get used to doing certain things in certain ways and they become like training scars uh, if we get really used to doing them. So we have to eliminate the training scars as much as possible, which means never giving up for us. Hmm. Uh, I've experienced in law enforcement and in military, people can keep fighting and they've been shot 10, 11, 12 times, even once in the head and they're still fighting. They're still going on. The, if the bad guys can do that, why can't I? Yet every, everyone I know, they go play in paintball, they get hit once with the paintball, oh, I'm done, I want, and they walk to the out place. Um, it's, it's difficult, you know, you got the rules that you're playing with your group and then you, it, it develops a mentality though. It's, you got to keep changing that up so that every, everything's different. Uh, you have to play by different little rule sets. So your mind never really grasps on one rule set so much. It's more adaptable, I think. It's, it's my solution. There are probably yeah. others. There will be those who think my solution is uh, rudimentary at best, too. Um, I, I have my students, we, you know, one, because competition is fun, and I, I have a lot of children in my school. Competition can be fun, and it's hard to talk about violence to them, but I prepare them. Hey, we'll play by taekwondo rules, and then we'll play by judo rules, and then sometimes we'll play a little bit of jiu-jitsu rules, uh, giving a whole realm of, hey, what's allowed? And, and much like a society, I mean, what, what I'm going to do to my uh, uh, uncle who was, was drunk and just being, you know, goofing around is going to be totally different to what I do to somebody who's trying to hurt my kid. So the rules change in society as well based on the situation. So it's one way to keep the mind flexible. Got it. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about today is the unexpected. Whenever we talk about a drill in a class, whenever we talk about a seminar or anything like that, we're talking about a situation that you know is happening, which always makes it easier. How, how much easier is debatable, but it always makes it easier to address. But my understanding of violence, and certainly my understanding is, is nowhere near yours, is that violence is most often unexpected. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a very fair statement. Uh, you know, when we're in class, it's, you know, we don't just suddenly have uh, 
for most classes, I know you don't have, a, you know, suddenly a melee erupt out or someone in the front line, just reach around, grab someone in the second line by the collar and slap them upside the face. It just doesn't happen. You know, what happens is, you know, hey, okay, we're going to practice whole shin stool now. Okay. Get into partners. Okay. You might mix them up. Okay. I want some small people with the big guys and mixing around men with women sometimes, but you, in the mind, you, you get somewhat prepared for the event that's about to happen. Um, on the street, um, in, in where I work in a correctional setting, currently in a jail, even um, violence just you know, it, it, you know, you could, one moment you're talking to them and just you know, bam, you know, they're suddenly they're grabbing you, they're hitting you, they're kicking you. Uh, you know, in in the I remember as a kid and then as a young adult, this whole concept as a stranger danger. We, we prepared a generation of kids to be always on the lookout for that stranger. So, you know, I asked my, uh, you know, I asked my students, okay, uh, some guy you don't know rolls up, says, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my dog. Can you help me? They go, no, I wouldn't help him look for my dog. No. But what pastor Bob came up and said, Hey, I'm trying to find my dog. And you knew pastor Bob had a dog. Would you get in the car with him? Well, yeah, but why? Well, cause it's pastor Bob. Now I'm, I'm not, poking fun at, at, at the, uh, or, or making light of the situations that happen. These are in the news. Uh, clergy are, are, are a group of trusted people. Uh, scout leaders, whether boy scouts or girl scouts, teachers, family members. We, are far, we find in the statistics show that most of the real violent things that happen to us have a real chance of being someone we know versus the ones we don't know. And when it happens, I mean, it's one, you want, they went from being someone we trusted to suddenly doing something that we would think was unthinkable, uh, rape, assault, murder. Um, you know, these were people that we, 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 we trusted and, and they suddenly put on a different hat and miraculously changed on us. And our, our brains are going to reel with that. They're, they're changing the role. And that emotional, that's, that puts us on most people into mental overload. Uh, I mean, what, uh, I think Ian Fleming uh, wrote for a character for James Bond. And James Bond's character always said, you know, treat everyone professionally and uh, with kindness, but I have a plan to kill everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's unpack that for a second, because that, that statement is very easy to dismiss as being unnecessary. But here, here's why I want, want to unpack that. And I want you to unpack that from your perspective, from your knowledge. I, have, I live in Vermont. I am permitted to carry a firearm in Vermont. I sometimes do. And I have a lot of people who are not fans of firearms who look at that and say, why? What's going to happen? You're going to be fine. Do you really think that there's going to be a problem? And my response is always two parts. First, if I thought there was going to be a problem, I wouldn't be going there. But secondly, and this is one of my core philosophies, I can be underprepared or I can be overprepared. I will never be perfectly prepared because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have the gift of foresight. But I will always choose to be overprepared. And part of that is often having a firearm ready. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you on that. In the state of Nebraska, we're allowed to have concealed handguns. Uh, we're actually also allowed to openly carry as well with a few minor exceptions in some locations, you know, federal buildings. We, that whole rigor mall, which we all know, um, they, 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 they take away certain aspects, but you know, our, the second amendment, and I, I hate to, go off that it's not just about the firearms the right to bear arms the right to protect yourself is what it's saying the fundamental right for me to defend my life and and those around me is what we really don't want to take away from us and in order to properly defend ourselves against possibilities do i think you know that when I go to church in my Lutheran rural community, that someone's going to come in and start shooting or killing people. I don't think it's going to happen. Has it happened elsewhere? Yes. Um, because it has happened somewhere else on the planet. 
it's always a possibility. So what does that mean for me? I go to worship. I, 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 I pray. I, I'm doing all my things. That, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the sign of peace to all my wonderful fellows that are in church. But I also know where every one of the exits are. And I know exactly what, what is around me community-wise. Who, who's now a new visitor? One, for two reasons. One, I don't know anything about them, so I'm going to introduce myself to them later. And two, I, yes, I do, I do keep a little eye on them because I don't know anything about them. Uh, when we don't know anything about anyone, we should always be a little bit wary. Uh, who do we, who do we uh, worry about more? The total stranger or those who we have known to hurt us? We worry about those who we know would have hurt us. Uh, we, Count Dracula, would you invite him into your house? <laughs> no! But if he didn't know it was Count Dracula, could you possibly invite him because he's a stranger, but he just moved into the neighborhood? Right. Yes, all oh, your new neighbor, come on inside, let me show you the house. And now you're just letting Count Dracula. I, you know, that's the things that happen. We still have to be friendly and professional and, and courteous to others, but that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, if, if vampires really existed, hey, yeah, I might actually have a clove of garlic around the house just to see if they move away from the kitchen area really big time. Uh, you know, I have these things prepared and carrying a firearm um, someplace and never having to use it. You know, I, I pray that that's all I ever, ever have to do when I carry my firearm. If I leave the house, you know, is that I will unload it and go, okay, I have to give my give it its little cleaning and I'll put it away. And I never have to fire it anywhere except the range. But uh, I have mental prepared lines in my head and, you know, what lines I'm willing to cross. I've already played the what if scenarios to an extreme to say, what, when would I use that firearm? At what point? You know, when would it get drawn? You know, everyone's, I've heard people say, oh, I'd draw it if I thought it was in danger. Well, if you don't know you're in danger, why would you draw it? But uh, if you know you're in danger and your life is threatened, why wouldn't you? Mm. You have the time and not capability to do so. You know, it's, it's like the unarmed tactics that we use. When would you use them? We have to have those lines drawn in our heads. Otherwise, it's, it's all theoretical application. And the whole emotions that will come in play when, when, when it does happen, you know, uh, quoting another great movie, chance favors the prepared mind. Now I know Steven Seagal is not in the greatest rage in some people's minds, but that, that quote from one of his movies is, 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 is absolutely true. Uh, you know, if you have a prepared mind, chance is going to favor you. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you. Um, now, we go ahead, finish. No, I didn't. Okay. I had one of those thoughts that just totally went somewhere else. You know, as I told you, hyperkinetic disorder, ADHD. Squirrel. Uh, <laughs> well, let's say we've got somebody listening and they're starting to wrap their brain around this. And of course, you're never fully going to understand violence until you experience violence. So my hope for everyone listening is that you never fully understand violence, at least not in a practical, experiential way, that it remains theoretical for you, as fortunately it has for me. But if someone's listening, and we've convinced them that their understanding of violence is inadequate, that they should be doing more, but they're not an instructor. They're not a school owner. They don't have any say over their curriculum. They just go to class. What can they do? Well, one of the things I encourage, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of correctional officers and my school, of course, is very far from where I work, uh, where, same as where I live. Just and, and that was kind of by design, but a lot of people don't want to make that trip to work with me. And I understand that. But uh, every now and then, I, says, I encourage them to get together with a, with a small group of people that have, have uh, been awakened to that possibility as well and start looking and what's around them, what, what would change? What, what, what things, and, and the what ifs, that is the greatest, I think, tool is the ability to ask yourself, what if? That whole white belt mentality towards violence. 
like when they were instructors seem to get totally irritated by it by when they're a white belt and they're asking well, what if they did this and then what if they did that and what if they do this and suddenly it, it spirals out of control most martial arts instructors have experience with this uh, and they nip it in the bud rather quickly <laughs> but but that's because they're having a class and they want to continue on down a, a specific viewpoint a specific uh path that they have planned and instruction would become chaotic if they didn't do that and having a small groups and small sessions kind of like what we're doing right now we're just kind of meandering down a path and talking about this and just talking about well what could i do if this happened what would i do if i saw this what would I do? That's a big one. What What would you do if you saw this happen? Uh, there have been TV shows all around. There's been a, uh, like what exposés when people see certain things. You know, you talk to them about it uh, offline, so to speak, and they don't know anything about what might be happening. And they're all about all the you know bullying's wrong or or uh, men should never you know pick up a woman and throw her onto a table and, and start hitting her in a public event. And uh, they would do something about that. They would intervene. And yet when something gets set up in a realistic sign of, uh, scenario and they witness something like that, they don't do anything. Now there's always a couple that will do something, but overall you'll see a lot of what is called apathetic attitude. They don't want to get involved. They're, they're fearful that, that that violence may get turned onto them. And if you don't play that, what if, what would you do? Where would that line be? Um, I had experience with something similar once the very first time I was off in college and I, I'm away from home. I, I witnessed something that was to me very shocking for both one. I, I never would have thought a, a man would treat a woman in a disrespectful way in, in a public place, throw her on a table and hit her. I used that example just a few moments ago. I saw this. Mm. And initially, my brain was like shocked. I couldn't believe this was happening. And then I became more shocked was no one else was doing anything. And then I realized something. I was that somebody else. And I stepped up. Now, and I intervened and, 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 and uh, dealt with the situation. Uh, since that day, I mean, I, I, I'm going to admit, uh, she got hit once or twice more that probably could have been stopped had I said, hey, that's wrong. I'm stepping in and done something. But I was dealing with the shock in my head. That was my, you know, granted, yeah, I was only 17 years old. Uh, my only, you know, I, I, I've been punched at in my life. I know how to deal with violence being directed at me. This was my first, oh, my goodness, violence is happening to someone next to me. What do I do? You know, and just... And if you, you realize that getting together with anyone else and talking through it, whether it's another student that has come to make the same realization, because like I said, you, you'll, you'll at some point in a class, you go, well, I wonder if this would really work. Uh, <laughs> but you never, eventually you eventually come to the same conclusions that most people come up to. And it's really hard to test it without hurting another person. <laughs> And so eventually, even the small groups that want to violence test stuff, you know, pressure test, I guess is what it's called nowadays, uh, realize you, you got to put safety precautions into place. Otherwise, you run the same risk. But the instructor realized they, they, they don't want to water everything down and become this uh, uh, accused of watering their teaching down. But then again, they don't want to create cripples and corpses to every class either. So, uh, Things have changed when I first started the martial arts in the 70s. I got, you know, when my stance was wrong, I got hit in the legs with a shinai. Uh, I remember that. And, and, and worse, it was really, man, I kept not getting the lesson. I he hit me in the, the leg with a boken. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I, you figured it out rather quickly. Uh, negative reinforcement can, can, can work really well, but you don't see that today because parents will sue the heck out of you and own your school. Uh, uh, it's, it's long, long. Krav Maga, when, of Krav, I, I studied some Krav from some Israelis in Israel. 
and they do some amazing stuff and it's a great system it's but it's not really in my opinion anything new under the sun technique wise it was how they trained and then they get to i got to the united states it's well the, you know with the exception of some of the military groups and, and some of the law enforcement groups that do the krav maga it's the same as every other martial arts school you go to. They don't want to create corpse and cripples. So they pull back because they don't want to be sued. So it, it's, I feel everyone is really hard as an individual. I, I, you know, you go, I got this idea and now where do I go? You, you got to get out there. And wonderful thing that we have today, social networking makes it much easier to find some of these people to get along get together and talk to. And, uh, do some laboratory experimenting, so to speak. Uh, protective gear has gotten much better, much lighter, much more uh, compact, so you're more maneuverable. Uh, I remember when uh, sparring when I first started, there was no protective gear. You had this uh, what you know, old foam sock gear that you wore over your fist or your your feet. Um, it hurt like hell. It really, it kept me from hurting my knuckles and the, my instep if I kicked with it. That was, that's what it basically did. It didn't really protect the guy I was hitting. <laughs> Chest protectors made you look like a, 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 a Michelin man. Uh, now, nowadays, we're getting much more compact. You can make all your natural movements. You can prevent bruising and damaging. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. Of course, that stuff costs money. and Average person doesn't want to pay fifteen hundred dollars for a suit of protective gear, which allow them to beat on each other a, a little bit more realistically. So, you know, it's a trade for you know, it's it's the same old equation: time, money versus our desire to uh, protect ourselves. Right. Well, I think this is a pretty good synopsis. I, I think we've got a a lot. The goal here, and, and I think we accomplished this, was to get people a little unsettled with their comfort, with their own understanding of what violence really is. So are there resources? Well, first, let's do this. How do people get a hold of you? Where are you online, your school, et cetera, if people want to reach out? Well, my school, uh, I can be reached uh, via my website is at uh, alphaomegamartialarts.org. Uh, it's all one word, all lowercase. Uh, Alpha Omega Martial Arts.org. And uh, my emails on, on the website, uh, as well as some of our, uh, our, our resources that we have affiliations there. Uh, Great. I, I work with, you know, small groups. I do, I do do seminars. I go around the country. I've done a few seminars in other countries as well. Uh, ability to reach out for me is, is always out there and available. Uh, in terms of uh, others resources out yeah. there yeah what else uh, is that for people? well i mean i i like pointing to people that are, are on the same path doing a great job tony blower's uh uh group uh and now i'm having a massive brain fart Spear, the Spear <laughs> Here, there it is thank you i couldn't remember his <laughs> i couldn't remember right. i won't tell him it was oh i'm sure he'll 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 he'll, he'll let me remember when he sees it and here's this interview. Yeah, I couldn't remember Spear, huh, Ro? Uh, <laughs> simple acronym. <laughs> yes, uh, T Tony Blower's uh, Spear program. Rory Miller's got uh, a great group. Uh, it's kind of mostly a small group, I mean, online studying. Uh, you just have to go out and do a search on in Google in terms of, I don't know where his, his web website, main website is, but you just did Rory Miller uh, Facing Violence. You'll, you'll find his uh his home page out there he's got some good stuff out there there yeah. are a lot of there are a lot of good resources out there in terms of dealing with violence uh, and actual practice and and there are there are instructors across the united states that 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 get this it's just and then there are others who and they know they they need to have a better understanding and, and i encourage those instructors out there hey the more you can get experience in it then the better service you can provide your students to prepare them. And of course, we're going to link to your past episode, Master Ahuja's episode, and of course, the episodes that we've done with Mr. Tony Blower and Rory Miller. And we'll and drop those. Mr. Pellegrini as well, I hope. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. For, 
Yeah, he's absolutely Rob, been on the show. Really Combat Hop Keto, and you know, yeah. we'll talk about. I, I think our program is a lot like others. We 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 deal with the potentialities of violence and some of our options. And Grandmaster Pellegrini has always been one to uh, focus a lot on the uh, what is not only workable, but uh, what's going to keep. Uh, keep you keep you defensible in court as well too. almost all of those organizations do that so perfect so the place for those show notes if anybody's new to the show whistlekick martial arts radio.com that's the place to go well i appreciate you coming back sharing all of this and i'm sure you and i are going to talk again but thanks for coming on oh thank you for having me jeremy maybe i won't wait three years next time one of my favorite things about this show is all of the wonderful different people that i get exposed to the people I get to have conversations with, to talk about something like violence, to ask the questions of Mr. Rowe that hopefully you would want me to ask. I always try to put myself in the position of the listeners. And as we went through today's episode, I really felt like we got into some good stuff. I felt like we unpacked a lot of things about the psychology of violence, things that aren't often discussed in the wider world of self-defense. I feel strongly that that psychological aspect is the most important aspect. And I hope that all of you got as much out of the show as I did. So Mr. O, thanks for coming back on, and I hope we talk again soon. We talked about a number of past episodes today, and we have links to all of them over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember, this is episode 397. And if you have something to say, I'd love for you to leave a comment there. Just scroll down below. There's a place for you to leave a comment. Tell us what you think. Do you agree with what Mr. O and I were talking about? Do you disagree? Tell us why. Or if you want to leave a private comment, maybe just something for me, jeremy at whistlekick.com is my email address. And of course, I'd love for you to follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and everywhere else you might imagine. Don't forget, Podcast 15 gets you 15% off everything in the store at whistlekick.com. We've got a ton of projects going on. If you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you should. You can do that at any of our sites. And we'll email you, let you know what's going on. And we even uh, sneak you in a code there, too. We want to help you. Help us. What's that line from Jerry Maguire? Help me help you. Something like that. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. (laughs) 